I'm Michael Jones. I'm the Chief Technology Advocate of Google. I think one of the biggest impacts of the Internet of Things on mapping is the need for pervasive location information. So in the future you'll have, for example, or even the present, wear sports shoes to go running. And those shoes would keep track of your location and your speed and your progress as you advance in your abilities. So that shoe needs to know where it is. It needs to report that to you in some way. So the idea of that many people wearing shoes, the shoes telling where they are, is, is going to be more data, more connections, and more information for maps than already happened today with people reading maps. One of the ways to think about the effect of the growth of the internet usage in terms of machine internet usage, the internet of things, and ge geolocation information or mapping is that most of that information to be useful has to come from a certain location. It's an event at a location. It's a, time, it's a temperature sample at a location, water flowing at a location, car speed at a location. It's all about the location. So one of the things that we're seeing in that, both at Google and through the Open Geospatial Consortium, OGC, is a tremendous number of people who normally never used geographic data before joining standards bodies so they can have their equipment, their tractor, their construction device. I, I met with people that make heavy cranes and uh, construction devices all over in uh, Japan and United States. They're all, they're all equipped now. Well, Google's well known for working on self-driven cars. We've been working on prototypes for a number of years and I'm sure will be for a number of years left. But one of the things those cars work on is a previously built map of all the information about the location. They know what to expect. When you see with your eyes, you know what to expect. So we build databases, the cars know what to expect. The cars also use sensors on the cars to determine what's changed from what they expect. Other cars, pedestrians, a rock in the road, trees, water, whatever is different. But they start with a knowledge of location. And so very accurate mapping of the entire planet is a first step for any future autonomous cars. The notion of self-driving cars is an open research area. Some people try to build them that have no knowledge of location. They use only photo and li LIDAR scanning. And some want to work from very accurate maps. At Google, we prefer to have very accurate 3D maps of the areas the cars are going to be driving. It gives us total knowledge that, for example, a location sensor, a GPS, isn't being spoofed. It gives us total knowledge that other devices on board may might be confused, but we can tell that if they are and we can stop driving and ask the user to drive. So so we're we're doing most all of our work now with very carefully pre-built maps of the areas we want the cars to drive. There are a great deal of changes that indoor mapping bring to the experience of using a map. And it's mostly motivated by the presence of a smartphone. The smartest thing about a smartphone is that it knows where it is. And we find that that means that you take it with you and you want it to be your guide inside a building or your way through a shopping center or your, your advice when walking around a city. And, and to, to get advice indoors where things change often in a store, we need the participation of the store owner. So it's not like Google driving a car around or flying an airplane around or buying data from local mapping agencies. This is a case where individual store owners take part in mapping their store for the benefit of all their customers. And so our indoor mapping efforts use a lot of data from the owners of buildings, from the owners of stores, and that's, uh, that's been wonderful. Mapping and augmented reality go together. Mapping is a statement of the truth. Augmented reality is an addition to the truth. It's extra information, perhaps which car in the parking lot, which store in the building, which child in the, in the crowd, is your child. It's extra information that is superimposed on top of that. But it also could be false information, pretend information, fun information. We built a game called Ingress that currently has two million people playing. So I know that there's a future for augmented reality in a non-real applications as well. Not just for finding the baby in the crowd, but also for finding the treasure in the lake or finding the, your friends in a game. And so I, I believe that actually reality will be augmented more and more. It'll be rare to just see a building without knowing which door the one you want to go into. Well, the relationship between Google Maps and Google Glass is a natural one. When you're out and about, you need directions where to go. 
And when you're using Google Glass, you can do something better than walking around staring at your hand holding a phone. You can just look straight ahead and glance up to see arrows for left and right. Things like that that are minor hints to you that are unobtrusive are much better than looking at a map. Obviously, if you were operating a car or something like that, it would be much better than looking down at a map. So I believe that mapping in the future will be, for as far as navigation mapping, will be uh, very much guided by non-visual cues. Either glance up at an arrow, uh, sort of a heads-up display for your eyes, or perhaps a vibration or sound. Google Glass also has speaker, and so it's a bone conductive speaker so you can hear. So it can say left, right, left. So you wouldn't have to look at anything. You just drive, walk, and then get perfect directions through a crowd, never looking at Google Glass or, or your phone, basically using the Google speaker on Google Glass as your navigation guidance. And so there are many very rich and powerful opportunities possible when you have a computer device that's mounted on your head where you don't have to touch anything.